What's up and welcome to One Take. My name's Gil and today we're talking about Quentin Tarantino's latest film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm going to start off with some high-level, spoiler-free thoughts, and then I'll give you a warning before I dive a little deeper into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, at that point, you can tune out, watch the movie, and then come back and see the rest of this review. So right off the bat, I'll say I absolutely loved this movie. And that's not a surprise, considering I've been a fan of every movie that Tarantino has done, and that includes his half of Grindhouse, Death Proof. So I loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And one thing that was a little different about this movie than Tarantino's previous films for me is that going into Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I had very little idea what to expect. I watched the trailers. I read the synopsis. So I knew the basics. You've got Leonardo DiCaprio playing Rick Dalton, a famous TV star who's kind of feeling a little washed up. You've got Rick Dalton hanging out with his stunt double, Cliff Booth, played by Brad Pitt. And then you've got Sharon Tate, played by Margot Robbie. And somehow in the backdrop, playing some kind of role in this movie, you have the Manson family. But my question going in was, what's the actual plot of this movie? What's the narrative arc that these characters go through? The funny thing is that when I sat down to watch this movie, a pretty decent amount into the running time, I was still asking myself those same questions. And I realized that this movie is sort of in the vein of a dazed and confused, a super bad, or even a Pulp Fiction, where it's less about a particular narrative or plot and more about a sort of day in the life or days in the lives of a few interesting characters. So that being the case, these characters being interesting and on a visceral level enjoyable to watch is very important. And I'm happy to say that they are. Quentin Tarantino has once again done a great job of creating compelling characters where even when there isn't a super tight and super clear narrative, it's just enjoyable to spend time in the world with these characters. Now, having said that, there are definitely moments of tension. There are definitely character progressions. And there are certainly awesome, hilarious, and unpredictable payoffs throughout this movie that justify the nearly three-hour running time. I think the movie's about two hours and 40 minutes. I should also say that this is one of Quentin Tarantino's funniest movies to date. He's had, I think, a pretty clear through line of comedy in all of his movies, but this one, more than any other Tarantino film, to me, prioritizes comedy over tension and violence and some of the other things that we're used to in a Tarantino film. Now, I'd say all those things that you're used to seeing from Quentin Tarantino are on display here, but he's just sort of tweaked the dials a bit. So comedy, character, come before plot, tension, conflict, violence, and things like that. Now, I will say there were a couple of moments. Like I said, it is a nearly three-hour running time, and that can be challenging to sit through when there isn't a clear overarching plot. Now, there was a moment or two where I started to get bored, but every time that happened, it very quickly became clear what the point of that scene is. Either it's progressing the character in some way, it's leading to some interesting payoff, or it's giving us some genuinely funny, hilarious moment, and the buildup was necessary for that. I'd also say all the performances in this film were great, especially the three leads, right? Margot Robbie, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Brad Pitt. But one part of Leonardo DiCaprio's performance that I'm still sort of questioning, and and this is on display in the trailer a bit, right? We know that his character is self-conscious, feeling like he's sort of fallen from fame, he's sort of washed up, and with that, Leonardo DiCaprio is trying to sell that by showing some nervousness and anxiety. At times, 
that felt a little over the top to me, where he had where his character has a, a, sor- a sort of uh, a, a stutter while he speaks because he's so nervous. But sometimes I couldn't quite tell what he was going for. You know, I found myself asking, is Rick Dalton, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, supposed to be drunk in this scene or is he just nervous? Uh, I'm not ready to say that it's a flaw in his performance. It was just something I questioned, didn't totally work for me in the moment. And part of the reason I want to rewatch this movie to sort of see if that clicks a little bit better for me uh, the second go around. I'd also say, although, you know, eight or nine times out of ten, everything that was set up in this movie paid off really well. There were some things that didn't quite pay off for me. And again, I'm not ready to say they didn't work, but it's something I want to rewatch and see if I can better understand why they're in the film. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in spoilers. So to recap, before I get into spoilers, this is a two hour and 40 minute film and it doesn't have a very clear narrative. That's not to say things don't pay off, but you will find yourself wondering, where is this all going? So you've really got to love the characters. But if you love the characters and if you're in for the ride, this is a fun movie with some great payoffs. If you're a Tarantino fan, I can't see you not enjoying this. If you're not a Tarantino fan, it might be a slog for you. So you can kind of use that to decide whether or not you want to see this movie. So I think that's everything I have to say before diving into spoilers. So here's your five second warning. If you haven't seen the movie yet, turn this off and go see it. Five, four, three, two, one. Time for spoilers. So I think this movie can be divvied up into kind of three parallel storylines. You've got Margot Robbie playing Sharon Tate, going about her day, bouncing from place to place, dancing a lot, watching her own movie on screen. That's kind of one story. You've got Leonardo DiCaprio as Rick Dalton, his fall from fame, his struggle to play a villainous role and really give it his all and sell it. Then you've got... Brad Pitt as Cliff Booth, again, just kind of uh, that's Rick Dalton's um, stuntman sort of going about his day, encountering some interesting characters. Uh, And I would say that off the bat, Cliff Booth's storyline, Brad Pitt's storyline is my favorite of the three. And that is probably the storyline which is most Tarantino-esque. It almost feels like Cliff is living in his own Movie, You know, he's interacting with Rick Dalton's storyline here and there, but then he goes off on his own and he's the only character that really encounters true life or death situations. He's the only character that's encountering true violence. And that might be why I found his storyline most enjoyable. So for that reason, I'm going to kind of save his for last and talk about Sharon Tate and Rick Dalton first. So first, talking about Sharon Tate, I would say that her character was a lot of fun to watch. Margot Robbie made Sharon Tate somebody that's easy to fall in love with. The the only question I have is it didn't feel like her character had much of an arc. Actually, I would say that really the only character that that to me felt like he had true progression and evolution as a character was Rick Dalton. I thought that Cliff Booth, Brad Pitt's character and Sharon Tate kind of encountered certain situations, but as characters didn't really evolve. But talking about Sharon Tate specifically, uh, it really felt like there wasn't much payoff to her story uh, besides the fact that her storyline kind of served Cliff and Rick's story, right? She was somebody that they saved ultimately at the end of the movie. So what was the purpose of Sharon Tate's storyline? To me, I think it's twofold. One, it's sort of a red herring because we know going into this movie that the Manson family in real life murdered Sharon Tate. So the whole time we're watching her, we're enjoying her character. We're falling in love with her character, but we're worried that at some point she's going to be a victim. That's one element of her story. The other element is 
because we come to care for her character and we've been watching her character for you know two plus hours ultimately when cliff booth is able to triumph over the members of the manson family that were sent to kill sharon that victorious moment feels ever so slightly better for us as an audience because we know that this character Sharon Tate, who we've been watching this whole time, is saved. So I think her storyline ultimately served as a red herring, something to make us worry, and just makes the victory at the end of this film a little bit sweeter. Then we have Rick Dalton's story, Leonardo DiCaprio's story. And I would say that his storyline at first feels like it's being played for laughs. So, for example, you have the scene where he's forgetting his lines. That scene was pretty funny. Even funnier is when he's back in his uh, trailer, giving himself a hard time, yelling at himself in the mirror, threatening to blow his own brains out. You know, he shouts into the mirror, I'm literally going to shoot your brains out. I'm not kidding. If you cannot get your lines right tomorrow, what the hell is wrong with you? That whole scene was pretty hilarious. But there were true moments uh, of emotion, too. When Rick has an encounter with um, 10 year old actress played by Julia Butters. Uh, and by the way, shout out to that actress. She did a great job. But in the scene where Rick is interacting with her and she's asking Rick uh, about the book he's reading, Rick starts to tell her about the character in that book. And he starts to choke up when he tells her that this character is starting to feel useless because he's been injured and can't perform his cowboy duties as well as he used to. When Rick got choked up, I'm man enough to admit I also got a little bit choked up. I, I really felt for his character. On the flip side, when he nails the scene as the villain in this movie, when he when he uh, when um, Julia Butters, that actress, tells Rick that he just did the best acting she's ever seen. That moment of triumph, I felt that right along with Leonardo DiCaprio's character. So his character had lows and highs that I truly felt uh, as part of the audience. And like I said before, I think his character is the only one that truly had a character arc where he had his fall from fame and he sort of rediscovered a love for acting and rediscovered the craft and the skill of acting. You know, he he was drinking too much, sort of falling apart, and we kind of saw him pull it together. The only thing I wish is that we got to live with that victory a little bit more than we did. But right after he nails that scene, we kind of go into that montage where we skip ahead six months. You know, we see him acting in Italy and then eventually coming back to the U.S., so I liked that storyline. I enjoyed that storyline. But the one I really enjoyed, like I said earlier, and the storyline which I thought was the most Tarantino-esque of the three, Brad Pitt's character of Cliff Booth. So a few things I want to say that I really enjoyed here. Number one, when his storyline is just sort of ramping up, we see his interactions with the hippie girl where she is on the side of the road asking for a lift, but he's going the other way. That nonverbal communication, the two or three scenes where they're communicating totally nonverbally was just was just fun to watch. Finding the creative ways that Tarantino found to have them communicate. You know, at first it's just a smile, a wave, a wink, and then it starts to be more hand gestures. Uh, at one point, she's upset that Cliff is going the opposite way, won't be able to give her a lift. And she does that exaggerated, you know, frown and tear uh, that was just a lot of fun to watch and then we have the fight between Brad Pitt and Bruce Lee which I believe was an imagined fight I interpreted that whole sequence to be Cliff imagining what would happen if he were able to get on set and uh, join Rick for his latest role. But that whole scene where Cliff is fighting Bruce Lee was just hilarious. Two moments I'll shout out are after Bruce is able to best 
Cliff in their first round and knock Cliff to the ground. When Bruce goes to attack him again and goes in for another kind of jump kick and Cliff sort of nonchalantly just grabs him and throws him against the car. Hilarious. Also hilarious is Bruce Lee is continuously making those sort of kung fu noises, you know, uh, and then at a certain point, Brad Pitt kind of does the same thing, but a little bit more half hearted, right? He sort of goes, Aww. sort of out of the side of his mouth. That whole scene was hilarious. And then we get to the scene where Cliff is visiting uh, Spawn Ranch, where the Manson family has sort of taken over. There's a lot of tension in that scene because, A, from history, we know that the Manson family are murderers, so we don't know if Brad Pitt is going to make it out of that scene unscathed. And even if you didn't go in knowing that history, that whole family is acting super weird, following Cliff Brad Pitt's character around. So you start to feel a little bit uh, unsafe for him, a little bit worried for him. But the best part is that Cliff handles everything totally nonchalantly. Great example of this is when he wants to go into the house where he knows that George lives. That's the owner of the ranch. And Cliff is obviously worried it doesn't really seem like George would just allow a bunch of hippies to come live on his ranch. So Cliff wants to go talk to him and everyone keeps telling him, you can't talk to George now. This is nap time. You can't bother him. So as an audience, we're starting to wonder, is George kidnapped? Is he dead? What the hell is going on here? But over and over again, all these characters are telling Cliff, you can't go in there. And eventually he just turns to them and says, you know what? I think I'm going to go in anyway. And hey, maybe he'll be awake. You never know. And the way he just insists on going into the house, even when Dakota Fanning's character, Squeaky, tells him, you can't come in now. And Cliff says, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm coming in and this, and he points to the screen door, not going to stop me. So, I fell in love with his character in this scene. The way he's able to just confidently handle whatever bizarre situation he finds himself in is just awesome. And then, of course, in that scene when he's finally ready to leave and he finds a knife sticking out of his tire, he turns and he sees a hippie laughing at him. So he knows that that's the hippie who stabbed his tire. And he just turns to him and says, you're fixing this. And when he refuses, he beats the crap out of him. And it's just that is one of those moments I mentioned earlier of extreme tension. Is he going to get out of here safe? And not only does he get out of there safe, but on the way out, he beats the crap out of one of these weirdos who is creating this unsafe situation to begin with. So extreme tension and then awesome, hilarious, satisfying payoff. I should also say here. Uh, I was reading some articles that PETA was complaining about this movie, saying it's going to create an irrational fear of pit bulls because Cliff Booth's pit bull in this movie has some pretty violent moments. Uh, but I'll say this movie did not make me afraid of pit bulls, but it did rekindle a hatred of hippies. I left this movie really hating hippies. So if PETA is looking out for pit bulls, hopefully somebody is looking out for the poor hippies out there. Uh, and then we've got to talk about the incredible ending. So the whole movie, we're counting down mentally to when these storylines are going to collide. We know the Manson family is out there. We know they're going to become murderers. We know they're going to go after Sharon Tate. And we're just waiting for that collision to happen. At a certain point, this becomes very explicit when the narrator, Kurt Russell, cuts in and starts telling us 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 10 p.m., literally telling us what time it is. So we're progressing throughout the day. The clock is ticking. At a certain point, those goddamn hippies are going to show up to kill Sharon Tate. And then just before they do, we have one of, in my opinion, the best depictions of drug use that I've seen. 
because I feel like a lot of movies have a tendency, a lot of R-rated comedies especially, will have a scene where characters do acid or some other hallucinogenic drug, and it's just an over-the-top scene of them, ooh, look at my fingers, ooh, wow, what's going on? And maybe there'll be some weird special effects, but here it's super subtle. Brad Pitt smokes a acid dipped cigarette and just as he handles everything else in a very nonchalant way he handles being high out of his mind also in a totally calm manner he he basically just moves his fingers and goes whoa <laughs> and uh, and then just says aloud the train has left the station so great depiction of drug use i found that hilarious and then, so the tension that's been building up throughout the movie where we're waiting for the Manson family to show up, boom, they show up, they bust into the house and hold the gun to Brad Pitt. We're confident in Cliff Booth's ability to handle a situation like this, but now he's high out of his mind. So there's a genuine for concern for his character. So it's very uncomfortable, this scene. And then Brad Pitt... Clicks, sends his dog after Tex, who's been holding the gun to his face. And we see those hippies get torn apart by the dog, beat up by Cliff, and, and hilariously, one of them torched by Rick Dalton, who apparently kept his flamethrower prop from the World War II movie that we know he was in, established earlier in the movie. So that whole scene was hilarious and incredible release of tension where we're worried about these characters and it was just a great climax to this film. A couple of things to point out about this scene. One, this is one of the few happy endings we've gotten in a Tarantino film. It's very rare for all of the main characters to survive a Tarantino movie. So this total happy ending where both Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth survive, and not only do they survive, but Rick Dalton meets Roman Polanski, which he wanted to happen the whole movie because that's a potential major opportunity to sort of rekindle his, his career. This happy ending feels like it couldn't have happened in an earlier Tarantino film because we've now watched eight movies from Quentin Tarantino where it's very common for main characters to die. So because we've been trained to fall in love with characters only to watch them get killed, we can watch this scene where the hippies show up at Rick Dalton's house, where they hold a gun to Cliff Booth. We can watch that scene and have genuine concern for these two main characters because it's been established by Tarantino in previous films that nobody is safe. So at least for me, watching that scene, I was so sure Brad Pitt's character was going to be killed. And Tarantino knew that because at a certain point, Cliff Booth, Brad Pitt's character, falls to the ground and we don't see him again for a few minutes. The next time we see him, he's lying there. The camera's on his face. The camera pans over to his fingers and we see his finger twitching and we breathe a sigh of relief that he is still alive. So that's just part of how Quentin Tarantino was able to play with tension in this scene. And I'll also say not only is there tension because we're genuinely concerned for the characters because it's been established in previous Tarantino films that they might die. But on top of that, the Manson family was real. The characters we saw in this movie were real. And in reality, they killed Sharon Tate. And in this movie, they need to get through Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth to get to Sharon Tate. So there are several reasons to have genuine concern for these characters. So Tarantino masterfully plays with all that to create tension, play with that tension, and ultimately give us just incredible reliefs and an awesome, happy, joyous ending. So overall, clearly I loved this movie. I loved the way we just had a great time hanging out with these characters. You're waiting for everything to collide, and when it does, it is glorious. 
and gloriously violent. A couple of other random thoughts that I had watching this movie. Number one, I think Quentin Tarantino's fascination with feet is uh, at this point, it's sort of become a running joke. There's a moment in this movie where when Cliff Booth finally picks up the hitchhiking hippie girl, the moment she got in the car, I thought to myself, all right, I guess I should be prepared to see her feet because seconds later, she takes her shoes off, shoves her feet against the front window of the car directly in front of the camera. And it feels like at this point, Quentin Tarantino is just doing that because we expect him to do it. And it's sort of just a a running joke. Uh, The other thing I'll point out is the whole final sequence of Rick Dalton, Cliff Booth beating the hell out of these hippies sort of feels like Quentin Tarantino's response to his critics. Because when those hippies are in the car sort of plotting what they're about to do, part of why they decide to attack Rick Dalton is one of the hippies points out that, hey, Rick is a TV star and all these Hollywood TV stars and movie stars. They're the ones who told us that violence is okay by constantly putting it on display on TV and in movies. So we should teach them a lesson for for desensitizing us to violence. So in a way, in that moment, it sort of felt like those hippies were the mouthpiece for all the critics that have come out against Tarantino for his violence. And I guess Tarantino's response to them is violently uh, destroying them. So I I just thought that was funny and sort of an uh, just an added meta element to that whole sequence. Like I've said and like I'll say again, I was a huge fan of this movie. I thought it was funny. I thought it was entertaining. I love these characters. I would love to see more of these characters, though I doubt we ever will, except for maybe in deleted scenes. Uh, I especially loved in this movie the way that, like I said before, there's this tension where you know at some point these storylines are going to collide, and when they do, it's awesome. It was one of the first happy endings that we've gotten from Tarantino. I mean, he's always had happy endings, but but, but there are always tainted with some other dark side. So in Glorious Bastards, we kill Hitler, but several of the main characters died along with him. So we get these happy endings, but this is the first one that that to me was pure. Our main characters all survived. Rick Dalton got what he wanted. History is once again rewritten. Sharon Tate, a character we grow to love throughout this movie, gets to live, and it's just an awesome time. Nearly three hours long, and I was enthralled the entire time and just had a great time at the theater. So I sincerely hope that Tarantino is going to make more than 10 films. He's consistently said he's going to retire after 10. So we're going to get at least one more. It might be a Star Trek movie. It might be something else, whatever it is. Obviously, I'll be in the theater to watch it. And I think that's all I have to say about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notifications whenever we release more videos like this one.